Lesson 1.2b, Approaches to Measuring GDP, the Income Approach. The second approach to measuring GDP is the aggregate income approach. Aggregate income, or total income of the economy, can also be divided into four big components. Recall the very simple example that we made up, saying that this economy only produces one product, which is the car, and the final price of the car, let's suppose, is $15,000. Can we look at this value of GDP, the $15,000, from the income's perspective? Why is this car $15,000? One big reason could be because of factored income. Workers involved in making the car. Businesses, management involved in providing the car. We need to pay them wages, profits, and let's suppose all of this come up to $12,000. So one big reason why the price of the car is $15,000 towards the end is because of the factor costs involved in it or the factor income involved in it. A second reason could be because of indirect taxes. The final price of the car is $15,000. And we all know that when we go and buy a car, very likely we have to pay some taxes such as GST, goods and services taxes, QST if you're in Quebec, or in other provinces, PST. Let's suppose all of these taxes add up to $2,000. So that's the second reason why the final price of the car amount to $15,000. The third component is subsidy. The producer of the car may receive some subsidies in the form of, say, a research grant from the government. What would happen if a firm receives some extra money from the government? What would happen to the final price of the car? The subsidy, in a sense, would lower the production cost of the firm. Very likely, the subsidy would lead to the price of the car to decrease. Now, suppose the final price of the car is $15,000 and some subsidies were actually given to the firm. What would happen to the price of the car if there were no subsidies to begin with? very likely the price would have been higher than the $15,000. So the price would have increased. So the more subsidies a firm would get, the lower would be the price. Let's suppose the subsidy that this firm got was $1,000. But because the higher this number is, the lower would be the price. We need to put in a negative sign before it. The last component is depreciation. Let's suppose the shipping company knows that from his past experience, when he gets the car delivered from the production site to say the dealer, during the transportation process, the car would get dirty. And by the time the car gets to the dealer, it has to be cleaned or detailed before it could be sold. In the process, we can say that the car depreciates, loses some value. The shipping company knows that in order to actually keep the car to be as good as possible to sell at the highest price, they have to hire some workers to clean it up first. How would this affect the price of the car? This is an additional cost, therefore the price of the car is very likely to increase. And let's suppose altogether, maintenance expenses, depreciation, or sometimes also called capital consumption allowance, amount to $2,000. All of this would give us factory income, 12000 indirect taxes, 2000 minus whatever subsidies the firm receive. The firm received 1000 so take away from the price, plus the 2000 because of the maintenance. Then all of this together would explain why the car has a final price of $15,000. Notice that the income of the workers involved in cleaning the car, maintaining the car, is grouped under depreciation rather than factory income. The main difference between the two is the services provided by the workers who clean the car are just for maintenance. They're not exactly adding new value to the car, they're just maintaining the value of the car. Whereas the workers involved in the factory income, they actually made the car to begin with and hence 
we group it under the $12,000. They add something new to the car. They actually put the parts together, actually made the parts, put it all together to make the car. They made something new for the economy. The income approach, to conclude, has four components. Factory income, workers involved in making the car. Indirect taxes, such as sales taxes. If the firm receives some subsidies, this will be taken out from the price of the car, plus whatever maintenance expenses. Depreciation, all of these together can also explain why the car is worth $15,000 or why GDP is $15,000. We often use G real GDP to measure how well we're doing. For example, say how rich the country is. Are we in an economic recession or an, in an economic boom? GDP does give us an idea in terms of what we're doing. However, it doesn't tell us the whole picture. For example, GDP only measures legal activities, illegal activities, drug trade, cash transactions are excluded. How much does that account for in terms of the underestimation of real GDP? For Canada, we don't know for sure, but we have an idea what the range is, somewhere between 4 to 15 percent of real GDP. So the official measurement of 1.5 trillion could have been, say, 10 percent higher if we include the illegal activities in it. An example, what type of illegal activities? In August 2009, there was an interesting study that looked at randomly US dollar bills and Canadian dollar bills, put these bills under a microscope, and see whether they would find traces of cocaine on the bills. What the authors found was somewhere around 85% to 90% of the bills they collected and put under the microscope actually showed signs of cocaine. Now, can you guess what denominations of the bills found the most cocaine? Turns out to be the $10 and $20 bills. So this goes to show, are we actually closer to the 4% range or 15% range? Well, I suppose I'll leave that for you to conclude. A second limitation of using GDP to measure how good a country is doing, how well the country is doing, is that it tends to be biased when we try to do cross-country comparisons. For example, if you look at Canada's per capita GDP, per capita GDP will be defined as the total real GDP that we have as a country divided by the population. So GDP per person. For Canada, this number is somewhere around $40,000 per person. Let's look at, say, the GDP of China, also per capita GDP, also measured in the same currency we converted into Canadian dollars. This would come up to around, say, 1500 Now, cross-country comparison of per capita GDP can we conclude, on average, a Canadian worker is about 30 times, 25 times richer than an average Chinese person? Not exactly, because the main problem with this is the cost of living, the purchasing power, the buying power of money. A dollar over here may not buy us much, whereas a dollar over in a less developed country, a poorer country, may be able to actually buy you a whole meal. Another shortcoming is that real GDP measures how much we earn as a country, but other factors that may not have a monetary value should also matter to us. For example, how much leisure we get to enjoy. We may produce a lot, we may earn a lot, but we don't get enough rest. What's the crime rate in the area that we live in? What's the pollution level? and other factors that you can think of. 
all of this would make it really hard to conclude how well we're doing by just looking at GDP because all of these factors would also matter.